Well, one thing that we didn't elaborate on is the junior program with the Shorthorn Association. And um, I feel that we have one of the strongest junior associations of all the breeds. Um, and it's more of a family-oriented breed, the Shorthorn breed. It's everybody's in one big family. Um, but I will say this, the juniors, our future in the Shorthorn breed, are strong in this breed. Mm -hmm. And we try to make sure that we can help any way at all to mm -hmm. Both to of us grew that. up in uh, youth programs in the breeds, I, I and Angus, Stephen, Shorthorn, and, and we know uh, the value of uh, the education that kids get, the experience they get, the network that they make, create in their life that helps them get into the good colleges, get through the program, and, and then get the, um, the start in their careers. And then hopefully in their careers, they are successful enough people to come back and say, you know, I've, I've had shorthorns in my family for four generations, and I don't want it to end with me. I want to have shorthorns. And so certainly that's important. Um, uh, I also think that um, we're both collectors. We're historical collectors. We both always have been. So our joint collection of um, livestock and particularly cattle uh, memorabilia and books. We have a vast book collection and magazine collection, pictures and, and different things, art. Um, and we're, we're, we're intent with that because, um, you know, you, you really can't know where you're going until you understand where you've been. And uh, we both are big believers in the, in the idea of, of reading those books. I mean, the oldest uh, shorthorn book that I have, um, found out today that Dr. Burt Moore has the same book, um, was written by Lewis Allen in, in 1798. Uh, you can sit down and read that book. It's, um, the, the writing is, is hard to read because it's long sentences with lots of commas and things. It's almost like reading a physics book sometimes, but it's so valuable. And then as we read the, the stories that we have a, a huge collection of Shorthorn Worlds from the very beginning, the, the first Shorthorn World that we ha have is from 1912. It's amazing the things that haven't changed. That's correct. The things that have changed, sure, you get it. The things that haven't changed, those are the ones that amaze you. Because uh, the, the why we breed cattle, the why we do this has not changed. It's all about improvement. It's and, about and, and speaking of history, I think it's very important cow families. When you look back at some of the old cow families that were very prevalent back in the day, and today some of those same cow families are very, very much popular and some of the best genetics that we have today. So those names and the numbers of the cow families and such, that's what connects us. Um, yes. You know, they, they could all be cows and they would just be a commodity, but when we kind of put um, characteristics and an understanding of, um, of their accomplishments and things through the different herds and, how, and see how they've changed through the way they've been mated over the diff different generations, when you see that, then you can understand that these animals in, in purebred seed stock, no matter what they are, no matter if they're cattle or sheep or goats or horses or rabbits, um, they all are individuals and e each individual has a certain DNA that makes it who it is. And then at these days we know more about these cattle, but, but as Steve pointed out with the cow family, um, there, there was a time in, um, I, I, have, I have an Insminger book, uh, the Insminger Beef Cattle Science book that is one of the early ones. And Dr. Insminger was in that book saying he didn't think cow families were important. And uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that from a science standpoint, he might be right. You know, but from a marketing uh, point of view, it's how we connect them, it's how we remember them, it's how uh, people who, Steve's a, a absolutely a master at mating cattle because he has a photographic memory of, of what those different lines of cattle are and what they were famous for. And so names, numbers, they go together. We're, we'll never, just because we go off on a, on, a, um, on a path to make numbers and a numerical expression like an EPD, just because we go off to make that important doesn't mean that we're going to leave the names of the, of the cattle or the breeders behind the cattle behind. They, it, it's one more layer of who these cattle are and what we can make them be for the future. This breed is the oldest breed mm -hmm. of all the breeds we have. Um, and you look back at the legacy of this breed. And um, I truly believe back in the day when it first I would say in the 60s and 70s going through, well, 60s for sure, go, going through the old shorthorn worlds and seeing Massey Ferguson tractor. They had shorthorn cattle. 
you, know, you look at a lot of the different breeders that were involved in the shorthorn breed back then, and I, I truly believe that the legacy of the breed is something that are, identifies to the roan shorthorn cattle that were good mothers, they had maternal strengths, they had problem-free cattle, and I think that that's really what got, got us to where we're at today. Well, when you think about the, the truly that's documented, the first breed of improved livestock of any species to come to this country was a shorthorn cow. And uh, they came here. Well, um, you know, certainly Hereford followed next, Angus followed next soon after. But that short, those shorthorn cows that came here, you know, nobody put them on a ship and brought them across the Atlantic Ocean hoping they'd do their job. They knew they would do their job. And uh, these animals are connected through generations. The DNA line doesn't stop. And uh, so uh, we are we're intent um, of getting back to that pure line of shorthorns. We've, uh, we've gone a different direction and invested uh, in cattle in Argentina. Argentina never has allowed, um, in their history, they've never allowed appendixing. So it's pure shorthorn breeding for over 350 years in Argentina. And we, uh, Steve and I, have invested not only money but our hearts in bringing those cattle and bringing that line of genetics to this country to help uh, to extend it to the next generations. And so um, the shorthorn cow's resilient. You know, uh, the, the shorthorn cow can live through all the man-made uh, management decisions, some good, some not so good, and she's lived through all of that. And I think that um, we have to go back to that original time. And certainly you can look at the old pictures and say, well, we don't want them to look like that anymore. You know, or we don't want them to do that anymore. There's the, the things that we know that we need, she can still do. It's up to us to, de to make those decisions and allow the shorthorn cow to produce what, um, what she always could produce. So the, um, the more education that we have among our breeders to take that step into the genomic world, the more uh, communication that we have among us through our, our uh, publications, through programs, TV programs like this, I mean, that, that connects us. And, um, and the belief that we have in taking um, an animal that, um, that has always existed and always done their job, they've always done their job, even in the conditions that we have imposed that have challenged them, this animal's always done their job. So imagine if all, if all um, conditions were perfect, what could they do? And today, in the age of genomics, in the age of IVF uh, reproduction, and what could we do to take these genetics, identify what the beef industry needs from us, from this breed, propagate it, and make it happen, and make it happen in a consistent fashion? You know, there's, there's niche markets all over now with the, what the consumer desires. Uh, we have, as Steve pointed, we have tenderness, we have marbling, we have docility of cattle. That's important to a consumer. A consumer wants to know that um, the steak that they're eating or the roast that they cook came from a cow that was treated well. You know, docile cattle get treated well. It's that simple. And we have to go back and go to the first question we were asked, and that's why do you raise shorthorns? And we have to delve deeper into that question and say why do shorthorns fit the beef industry, the cattle industry, why do they fit what the consumer wants from our product today?